Hello, dear ones. My name is Justin Peters. I hope that you and your family are doing well today. I want to thank you very much for watching this video. And in this video, I'm going to be interviewing Pastor James Coates. James is the pastor of Grace Life Church in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Undoubtedly, most of you know that he has was arrested and spent over a month in prison. And so I know this is kind of a lengthy video, but I, I really would... Uh, encourage you to watch all of it uh, and uh, don't miss the concluding remarks and I have everything time stamped uh, down there below so uh, please do watch that because the conclusion of this uh, I think has got some really powerful stuff you'll hear a, a letter from James Coates read by John MacArthur and uh, some some important things there at the end so uh, thank you very much for watching and we'll go into it right now it is a distinct honor and privilege to be able to interview James Coates. James Coates, you probably know that name. He is the pastor of Grace Life Church in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And most, if not all of you know that uh, James was arrested. He spent over a month in prison uh, for holding church, for having church services in violation of the health mandates related to COVID up in Canada. And so um, James is out of prison and uh, he has graciously agreed to do this interview with me. And I just want to take this opportunity to, to talk with James and uh, let you hear from him about how things are going with him and some of the things that he has experienced over the past few months. So, James, brother, thank you very much for joining me for this program. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Thank you for uh, your patience just in it coming together. We've been trying to do this for a little while now. Yeah, yeah, no worries, no worries. You've, you've had much on your plate, so that is quite all right. So, uh, James, I, I think most everyone probably watching knows kind of the gist of what has gone on with you, but we may have some people watching for the first time and, and uh, are not familiar with your story. So tell us a little bit about who you are, where you pastor, and, and what's been going on in the past few months, if you will. Yeah, so my name is James Coates, and I have been um, the pastor teacher at Grace Life Church for, uh, well, since about January 2013, but I've been at Grace Life Church and preaching for uh, nearly 11 years now, and I'm a graduate of the Master's Seminary, uh, twice actually, because I, I completed a doctor of ministry in, um, well, just last May, actually, oh, wow. and uh, so yeah, we've been just faithfully doing ministry all this time and, and uh, our church has been growing spiritually and, and, uh, and numerically. And, and in this season of the, uh, the virus with COVID-19, we, um, we got to the point of, of opening our church, having determined that the virus itself was not severe enough to warrant fundamentally altering the way that we worship. And, uh, and initially we were open and, and just doing life as usual and not receiving a lot of attention, but, um, and, and not having, uh, COVID-19 cases in our church. And then in November, there was a, a second declared public health emergency. And that really upped the ante as far as the attention that we were receiving from AHS, which is our health services department, as well as the media. And, uh, and so into uh, December, things began to heat up where media is just outside our church and, and videoing what's happening in our parking lot as people go into the church. And uh, AHS is coming to our services with the RCMP, which is our police uh, service in our, our region of, of uh, this province. And, um, and so we've got the RCMP and AHS in our building for our services to basically see what's taking place and gather evidence that's going to be used against us. And, uh, and, you know, we did our best efforts to honor the RCMP as they came into our facility. And so we would actually stand and applaud them for their, their services to our, our, um, our community and, we realize that they've got a tough job to do, yeah. uh, even though what they're doing right now, in my estimation, is outside the scope of what they ought to be doing. They shouldn't really be enforcing health orders. They should be um, enforcing against crime. Right. Um, but anyway, things just uh, 
slowly escalated and uh, and did to the point where on February 17th, or rather, sorry, February 7th, I was given an undertaking. I was arrested with an undertaking and that uh, that undertaking built into it had a condition that I comply with the Public Health Act, which meant that I would have to comply with all the public health orders. And I, I indicated that, that, that at that time I could not agree to that condition. And, and they said, that's fine. Uh, you can refuse the condition, but it's still going to be in force. And so when we met on the 14th, the next Sunday, I was in violation of that condition. And so I, I drove myself into the RCMP on Tuesday, uh, following that Sunday, was, uh, was arrested, detained, and brought before a justice of the peace. And the, did you the, know, James, as you drove yourself to the RCMP, did you know that was going to mean your arrest? Yeah, I knew I was going to be arrested. And, um, you know, there was reason to believe that I would be released but part of the reason that I was given that impression is because uh, typically when you're given a bail condition, you sign it. So the, the, the officer that I was engaged with um, didn't really have a category for not signing your bail condition. So he believed I was going to be going home that day with a bail condition. And um, so when I brought, was brought before the justice of the peace, I was not going to be uh, taken to remand. He didn't think that the, the violation on the 14th warranted me being imprisoned, but he gave me a condition that required that I agree to abide by the Public Health Act. Now, there's two things with that. One, if I agree to that condition, functionally, I can't, I can't carry out my ministry as I believe the Lord would have me do. Right. So I'm, I'm, I'm basically... Uh, handing the keys over to Caesar and letting Caesar dictate the terms of worship to us. So there's that piece. The second piece is if I sign the condition and then just, you know, decide I'm going to willfully violate that condition, the, the legal issues that you step into at that point in time are, are, are exponentially greater mm. because, um, I mean, you're taking the criminal side of it to a whole new level at that point in time by breaching your bail condition. So, yeah. I mean, it's an integrity issue on the one hand. I mean, are you going to sign a condition and then go and violate it? That's, that's, that's inappropriate all on its own. Right. Um, but even to do that is just increasing the, the weight of the law against you. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So, yeah, I, I couldn't sign that condition. And, and that meant that I was going to end up at remand. Uh, and so that's where I was for 35 days. I was in jail for 35 days at remand. Yeah. Wow. Well, James, uh, so many of us have watched you and, and your family through this, and I had the opportunity to interview your wife, Erin, while you were in, in prison. And, um, and I, you and I talked a little bit for a few minutes before this interview started, and, and so uh, you've heard me say this already, but for those watching, Erin um, has just been amazing through this. I was so impressed in watching a couple of interviews that she did with others. And then when I interviewed her, her poise, um, the depth of understanding of the issue, her uh, focus on scripture, the authority of scripture and the importance of your role as a shepherd and brother, what, what a wife God has given you. I mean, she is just, uh, she was so very, very impressive and, um, and how she handled all this. Um, do you have anything to, to add to that? Uh, I'm sure you do. I mean, I would just say she is the real deal and uh, huge, a huge blessing in my life um, next to my salvation, uh, the greatest gift, my, my greatest earthly treasure. And um, yeah, I mean, she, she's the real deal and she, she gets it. And, uh, and there's times when she'll even address the matter and, and say it better than I do. And, uh, and so she's, yeah, she's a phenomenal woman. Um, I love her dearly and uh, couldn't have asked for a better wife to be with me in ministry. I mean, God had a plan when he put us together. And uh, so, yeah, just richly blessed. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. The, uh, 
Oh, I, I can't even imagine what, what you have been through as a family. And, and I kind of hesitate to, to ask this question because I see, like, when you see something on the news, someone's been through a tragedy and the reporter always asks, well, well how are you feeling? And you, you, know, you think, well, well, how do you think they're feeling? It's, it's, <laughs> it's not fun. So at risk of asking one of those questions, obviously this has been an extreme trial and continues to be for y'all, but what has this been like for you personally, for Aaron, for your family? Um, give us a, can you give us a sense of some of the emotions and things that you've experienced through all this? Yeah, and it's difficult to even try and summarize that and and to do so in a way that would be helpful even to your audience um we're living this and so we're this is this is life and it's not glamorous to be sure it's difficult it's challenging god's grace is with us Mm -hmm. power is perfected in weakness and so his grace is sufficient um and so this is just life for us. It's, uh, it's, it's where the Lord has us. We've been through seasons that are challenging in ministry. And so we know what it's like to suffer uh, for the sake of biblical ministry. And, and now this is certainly on a, a new level and, and new scale and different context than we've ever experienced. But, um, and it's been something that's progressed, right? Like we, it just didn't arrive. There's been a, we're in a season and this season has been progressing over time. So we've had time to acclimate to each step along the way mm-hmm. and, and to prepare even for my imprisonment. I mean, we, we knew that that was a possibility. And, and so we're having discussions and even to some extent, you know, utilizing humor uh, to, to address the reality that imprisonment is on the horizon. And um, I mean, because if you're going to, purchase something you know one of the questions you're going to have is well am i even going to be able to utilize this if i'm in prison for example you know and uh and so there's a little bit of of levity that you would employ to um sort of digest the reality of what's taking place right and so you know i think along the way in preparation for me uh i had to basically have moments where i'm brought to a fork in the road and having to look at the, the reality of enforcement and consequences and having to decide, am I going to follow Christ? Am I going to be willing to uh, submit myself to the cost? And there's all kinds of turmoil. All the things you would expect to experience are there in those moments. The, the stress of them, the anxiety of them. I mean, I remember, for example, uh, on a particular Saturday, when I had asked my lawyer, you know, what are the odds? You know what it was? It was, uh, it was after, uh, about middle of January, we were taken to court and given a court order to abide by the, uh, the health guidelines. And we opted to continue to gather and that would have put us in contempt of court and contempt of court in Alberta, um, comes with a, a, a consequence of up to two years in prison. And so, um, you know, and then as I'm parsing it all out, and even as a leadership, we had to decide what we were going to do. As I parse it all out, I go, well, I mean, what are the odds they're going to actually put me in prison? I mean, I'm a pastor, you know, so yeah. there's going to be a consequence, but surely they're not going to put me in prison. Well, on that Saturday, um, right about noon, I speak with my lawyer and I just, I ask the question. So what are the odds that we're actually going to see? I'm going to see jail time for this. And he was like, well, pretty likely. And, and I said, okay. He's like, yeah, you're not going to likely see two years, but you know, a couple of months. And, and so that, that, that comes with a blow, you know? Um, Yeah. And so that day, you know, after that phone call, I'm, I'm bearing the weight of the reality of possible jail time for simply having a church service. Right. And, and, and so there, you know, you're feeling 
all of the things you would expect to feel in that moment, fear, anxiety, pressure, stress, there's physiological effects, you know, from, you know, headaches to, um, to everything that you experience when you're under that kind of pressure. And, and the Lord just ministers to you in the midst of that. And he carries you through that and you digest it. And then you come to the place with, okay, Lord, if this is what you want me to do, I'm going to do it. And so you have all of these moments like that along the way so that you're, you're being prepared yeah. for, you know, the, the consequences that are going to come. And, and then by the time it is time to decide between whether you're going to, you know, choose your comforts or end up in prison, you've kind of already settled it and, and, you know, you're going to jail. So, um, was so, there, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's been, it's been a whirlwind for sure. And it's not over. So, yeah. Was there ever a time, I'm sure the temptation had to be there, but how, how, how severe was the temptation? How, how much of a temptation was it to say when the reality of, prison was sitting setting in with you how much was the temptation to say you know let's just do it like other churches are doing it we'll hmm. we'll we'll do zoom meetings like you and i are doing now we'll you know we don't like it we don't agree with it but let's let's go along let's let's bow to caesar and let him have his way for this season and then we'll get back to it later how much of a temptation was that for you you know, it's not a great temptation. I mean, there's no question that you, you, as you, there's a part of you that wants to avoid suffering. I mean, um, you know, even if you think about our Lord in the garden, he's asking, is there another way? And, and even this morning as I'm, I'm with the Lord and praying and, and, and just feeling the context that we're currently in, I'm asking the same question. Is there another way to be faithful and, and, not, and not go through what we're going through. So there's no question that you're asking that question. And, and, but it doesn't, it's not, it's not a big temptation because it doesn't take long for you to go, I can't. Hmm. There's this compulsion within that just, you can't, I can't. It's a conviction that just, won't go away it is it is settled and so you know you you ask the question and you 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 look down that road and 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 but it doesn't take long for you to go yeah i can't do that yeah and and then and that's where you your resolve begins to build and that's where you 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 know you you plant your 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 flag and and um and you park your car and, and you just don't move. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Well, you and I were talking just before the interview started and I, I said that there will be no doubt with your kids that their dad believes what he professes from the pulpit, that he believes mm -hmm. that it's not just lip service. It's not just a performance on Sunday morning. I mean, you have fleshed that out. There will be no doubt your kids know that you believe what you say you believe. Well, and you know what, like that, that's a huge, that's a huge piece. So I've preached Daniel three, um, you know, I've, I've preached on the, the, the cost of following Christ. And, and when you're in a season like this, you're going to make portions of scripture, portions of scripture as a preacher, you can't go to you right. can't even preach them with passion and no one's going to listen to you because yeah. you, you were not willing to, to, to take a stand for Christ. And, and so that's a huge thing. I mean, as a preacher, I don't want to come to texts that, that require thunder from heaven on the need to be resolved to obey Christ that I can't even preach them because I was unwilling to obey him as it relates to his headship over the church. I mean, this is critical. Right. Who is the head of the church? Amen. And so, yeah, I mean, um, that's significant. I, I, uh, I, there is an internal joy and blessing that is there right now, even in this moment, because I know, give me a portion of scripture to preach and I can preach it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and as a preacher, you, you, you want that. 
And, and so praise God for that. Um, I just give him thanks and praise that, that I don't need to avoid portions of scripture. And, uh, and so I don't know what to do with these other guys who are complying. You know, I don't know how they, do they ever preach Daniel three? You know, do they, do they ever preach Daniel six, which is even more fitting? Um, I don't know. I don't know what they do. Yeah, exactly. Brother, I, I've told people often in my own teaching, there's obedience is in and of itself its own reward. Hmm. Because we know we are when we are obedient to Christ, we are pleasing Christ. And whether or not we see tangible benefits, tangible rewards for that, whether or not we see it. And sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. Hmm. Uh, but knowing that we are pleasing Christ, that is the reward. And, and you have the blessing of having a clear conscience. I so appreciate what you just said. You can, you can go to any text and preach it with a clear conscience, and there's no value that you can put on that. Amen. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, James, talk to us a little bit about what you experienced on the inside. Um, hmm. uh, what did you have with you? Did, did you have a Bible? Uh, what, what did you do? What was a typical day like for you? One of the challenges in prison is, um, you know, if you think about being in your home, you've got uh, a chair and a desk that you, you typically like to, to work at. If there's a place that you want to relax for a bit, you've got a, a seat or a chair in the home, a couch that you like to sit on that you can, you can enjoy. And, and so you got to picture yourself in a cell with a bed that um, isn't the most comfortable bed. But not. And, and basically one, one kind of really hard sort of bench that, that you can sit at with a table that you can use, a little tiny table. And, and that's about the extent of it. So you can either stand you can lie down on your bed or you can kind of sit on this pretty hard uh, bench and you're in your cell quite a bit. I mean, uh, once out of the quarantine, I was basically out of my cell for about three hours a day. So that means for 21 hours, you're, you're in your cell. Yeah. So one of the challenges as I reflect on it is just, is just being comfortable, you know, um, in the time that you're in your cell. And, uh, what's really interesting is the guys that are, that are often in prison are very, uh, industrial. So they, they have, they got all these ways to kind of make the cell more, um, accommodating, more comfortable than it would be otherwise. And so the guy that I was with, he, he made like a, a seat cushion for me so that I could sit on this really hard, you know, bench and, and be and be comfortable because I spent a lot of time on that little seat there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I mean, it's 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 hard on the body, and um, and and my body's actually I'm I'm in a place in my life where I was an athlete early on, and for a long time now I've been kind of, you know, I, I've been a little bit athletic with some of the stuff that I do, but I my I'm losing lots of muscle and and um, and I'm I'm experiencing all kinds of pain in my body, mm-hmm. in my hips, for example. And, and it's, I think it's just the, I need to go to the gym and I need, I need to work out. And, and so, but yeah, being in prison is, is hard in the body. So you're, you're feeling it in, in, in different ways. And, and I started to do some exercises while I was in there that was to kind of mitigate that. And it was actually helpful. Um, you know, the, the food component is, is a challenge because what they provide is not really enough to sustain you. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm probably like a 2,000 to 2,500 calories a day kind of a guy. And I think with the food that they provide, you you might get like, I don't know, 12 to 1,500 calories. And wow. so then you got you to gotta make up um, the calories through what they call canteen. So you buy canteen from the store basically. And that gets delivered once a week. Um, but even then it's, it's trying to figure out like, how are you going to make up the difference? What are you going to do? You can eat Doritos, you know, all day or, or, and I, I, it took me a little bit to kind of figure out how to use the canteen to, to, to not take its toll on my body as well. 
And so it's a lot of peanuts and almonds and stuff like that to, to try and make up the difference. And um, so, yeah, the, the food component's a challenge. Um, and, you know, in, in any given day, you're, you're up and down depending on what's going on. I could receive all these letters on, on a day and, and that would provide a couple of hours of encouragement and, and joy and blessing and would really put fuel in you to, to persevere and then you could get information either from the radio that was coming into your cell because you can listen to talk radio and it's left wing so it's it's not for oh. you at all oh, and um Gosh. and so you're that's coming in so you're, you're you're dealing with that and and so yeah it's just up and down very up and down um i didn't know that i would ever get out of there to be honest with you uh, I didn't, I just didn't know that, that I would ever get out. And I was in there knowing that that was a possibility. And uh, because, you know, while I'm in there for why I'm in there, everything on the outside is escalating. I mean, the government is just doubling down and tripling down on, you know, their enforcement and restrictions and guidelines. And so I just didn't have any confidence that I was going to be able to get out and uh, it's amazing too like just so you know like I literally could have you know walked to the the desk where the guards were on any day at really any moment and just said uh, I'd like to sign my condition and that would have begun the process of getting out like I, I I literally and you're in your cell so you can call down I could have just used the the, the telecom and said, guys, I want to sign my condition. And that would just start the process. I would have been out, you know, later that day or the following day. Wow. And, and that wasn't, that wasn't a, a real temptation either, to be honest with you. Um, it, uh, it really wasn't. I, you know, I had moments, I had a phone call with, uh, with a number of the guys in our leadership on a Sunday morning. I called Aaron on a Sunday morning and they're, they're gathered at the church and, and, and I ended up talking on speakerphone to a number of the guys. And I was, I remember a Sunday pretty late in, maybe four weeks in, where I was just kind of, you know, a little bit down and, and wanting out. And, yeah. um, but even then, it's not like I'm tempted to go and, and, and sign the condition. I, I think I said at one point, if I was ever feeling tempted to, to do that, now's the time. But it, it wasn't a real temptation um but yeah i could just literally ask them let them know i'm ready and and they would have done the paperwork and i would have been out of there so um but yeah i mean uh, you're just you're just trying to you're just trying to plow through each day and and um and you know i i like getting to bedtime for whatever reason and um and you go to bed and you wake up in the morning and you do it all over again so yeah yeah Wow. Well, I tell you, brother, a, a pastor in your situation that is, was not committed to sufficiency of scripture, of course, he wouldn't have been in there in the first place, but just for, I mean, theoretically, um, you know, a pastor that has been blown about by say like the winds of social justice or, you know, social mm -hmm. gospel or something, he would have, he would have been pushing that intercom button in a heartbeat. Yeah. And never would have gotten there. Never would have gotten there, right? But let's let's say he was just for argument's sake. I mean, he'd have been that button would have been worn out from him pushing it. Yeah. So it's true. Uh, what about because uh, this is a, a question I've had and I've thought about. You're a pastor. You're a shepherd, and of course, you were away from your flock, and yeah. not that you have a flock in prison because you know, a flock is by definition, a church is by definition, those who have been called out and, and saved. And, and the assumption is, is that most of the guys in prison are not regenerate. I know salvation does happen in prison, but most of them are not, you know, they're not regenerate uh, when they come in. So what kind of ministry, to use that term, opportunities did you have with the men that you were were with did you have witnessing opportunities with some of those guys what was what was that like yeah so i mean the guy one thing you have to know and this is somewhat surprising is that more guys uh in prison believe they're christians than you would think yeah um yeah I, I, and 
Yeah. So, so in some cases, you're, you're almost trying to get them unsaved. <laughs> right. <laughs> to get them saved, you know? Right. And, uh, and there was quite a bit of that, for sure. But, um, and, and that even, in some ways, you know, applied to my, uh, my, my cellmate. Like, I, I challenged him a little bit because he believes he's a Christian. And, and you know, I, I didn't want to pass judgment on the man, but I, was, I, was, I could hear him speak. And, and I was saying like, you know, I think, I think we need to evaluate whether or not you've truly been born from above. Like I, I'm not, I'm not denying that you have positive sentiment toward Jesus, but, but I'm not totally convinced, you know, the Lord. And, uh, and he was open to that. He didn't take that with offense. And, and I had time to, you know, spend with him reading the scriptures with him and, and, and talking to him just as an aside, I, I read him Daniel three, just a straight reading. And I just, just read it to him. Uh-huh. And when it was all said and done, he was just like, man, that sounds a lot like what you're going through. Really? <laughs> just wow. a straight read. I didn't, you know, and um, anyway, so, so I had lots of opportunity with him. Guys would just come to my door. I'd be in my cell and they'd be on exercise yeah. uh, because there, there's three tiers. And so, there's a tier on exercise at any given time, unless we're all in our, our cells for, for food and uh, to eat. And, uh, and so guys would just come to our door and they'd knock on the door and they'd be like, are you the pastor? And I would say, yeah, I'm the pastor. And, and I'd, I'd just be talking to them through the door. And uh, which is really amazing, just as an aside. Um, let's say hypothetically you want um, hot water and you're in your cell and another guy is on exercise they've got a way to pour hot water uh, through the door to a guy in his cell so he can get the hot water he needs to have a coffee. I mean, just, just oh. very industrious guys, the way they, they do stuff. So anyway, lots of opportunities like that where guys would come and I would be basically ministering to them through the door. Um, on my, my tier, it got to the point where we were doing Bible study in the evening and I was basically just in John and John one on who Christ is and always taking it back to the gospel, John three and the new birth, John 10 and, uh, and just getting into the gospel and regeneration and, and answering questions they had. And so, and and that was really interesting because I would just go and sit down, open my Bible and guys would come to me. Um, Mm -hmm. There was one gentleman in particular that said, Hey, can we do a Bible study? And, and, we couldn't really do it like in, a, in the cell because you're not supposed to be in somebody else's cell. So we had to go down to the floor. And so he and I sit down, I open my Bible and then three or four of the guys come within a minute to sit down. And uh, wow. so there's no question there. There's a desire for that, that there's a, there's an appetite for it. And, um, and so I had, I had moments like that. I'd, I'd go, you know, to, to, to speak to somebody else in a, in a cell and on the way by guys are banging on their door and want me to pray for them. Um, you know, and a lot of time it was just like pray for their bail hearing. And, and so they just want me to ask the Lord to grant their bail basically. And, yeah. but you know, I, I would, I'd get their name and, and translate that into opportunities to pray for their salvation. And, uh, and so there was lots of moments like that. I couldn't talk to the guards a whole lot. Um, there were some guys that I got a bit of a rapport with, but yeah, you couldn't really have a, a long extended discussion with a guard effectively. They, there's just a distance that's kept between them and the inmates. And so I didn't really get a lot of opportunity to share the gospel with the guards, but, but they all knew who I was, you know, like you think about Paul and the, the Praetorian guard, it didn't yeah. take long for the whole Praetorian guard to know who I was and why I was there. And, yeah. um, I'll tell you this one story. I, I come in to my first cell entering into quarantine. So I'm just like, I'm a newbie and I'm with three other guys or two other guys, rather there's three of us. And, and the guy says, the guard says, great. Um, three fresh criminals off the street. And, and, and that's the kind of, he's being, you know, facetious, sarcastic. And, right. and I'm hearing this as a pastor who's not coming off the street, who's coming out of his church. Right. And uh, so I ended up going to him and, and at one point just saying to him, hey, do you know why I'm here? 
And, and that would be a, an unusual question to ask because you could get like a negative response. Like, you know, what are you even talking to me for? Go back to your cell, he could say. Right. But I just asked him if he knew why I was there. And, and he said, no. And I, I told him I'm here for breaking the public health act as a pastor and hosting services. And he, he looked at the file so he could see that that was true. And I forget exactly what was said at that point beyond that, but I ended up back in my cell and not long from there, he goes, uh, Hey coats. And I'm like, yeah, he's, he's speaking to me through my telecom. Uh-huh. And uh, he says, you want some paper and a pen? And I was just like, yeah, sure. And he's just like, Bunyan did his best work in prison. So I figured you could use a paper and a pen. And, uh, and that was like, you know, day one or day two. And, and so that was like a little bit of a moment where you could see how the guards were going to relate to me in a positive way. And he's thinking, you know, I'm going to give this guy some paper and a pen. And he's going to write, you know, Pilgrim's Progress number two. And, uh, <laughs> so this, he knew who, he knew who John Bunyan was. Yeah. It, well, and, and there's a number of the guards would claim to be Christian. In fact, the guards at times would feel like they had to apologize to me because I, my presence there was convicting them in terms of how they spoke to the other inmates. And yeah. so when we would have, like they'd come into your cell and do like a, a survey of your cell and just see what's going on in your cell, that everything's okay. And so there'd be interaction that would happen briefly there. And some guys would apologize because they'd be trying to say, you know, we've got to talk to the inmates the way we do because, um, you know, we've got to make sure they understand who's boss and that kind of a thing, and, which I understand. But right. you could tell that there, there's some conviction there. Yeah. And, uh, but yeah, a lot of the guys, a lot of the guards would claim to be Christian, to be honest. Oh, huh. interesting. Yeah. 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 I was just thinking, I mean, a lot of people claim to be Christian. I suppose most people still, in, in, at least in the United States and Canada, claim to be Christian. But uh, not many of them would know who John Bunyan is. <laughs> <laughs> but uh yeah, yeah no this guy he did he knew oh how about that well were the guys were the inmates uh, sorry to see you leave yeah I, you know um i was getting a lot of publicity because uh there's a radio station called ched it's talk radio and on that radio station every 30 minutes they have a, a news loop and i was in that news loop an awful lot in fact when i was in the cop car going to the courthouse the day that I was going to remand and then to the remand center, uh, I could hear the, the radio in the cop car talking about me and the fact that I was going to prison. And, uh, and so there was lots of, of, of media attention that way. And so, and leading up to my release, there was lots of uh, media attention around the court case and what was happening and, and everything like that. So by the time I had received um, release from the judge in my own bail hearing, it didn't take long for that to end up on the radio. And that's getting played into the the cells on my pod. So everyone knew when I was going to be going that I was going to be going. And uh, I remember at one point, for example, uh, the chaplain came to visit me, and I'd already been told that I was going to be, I had to get my stuff ready because I was going to be leaving. So the judge has said, you're going to, you're, you know, the release is happening. I'm now back in my cell. The guards have said, pack your stuff. You're going to be leaving this afternoon. And then a chaplain comes and I'm like, I'm wondering, do I bring my bag with me? He just wants to spend some time with me, but I'm like, do I have my bag with me or not? So I grabbed my bag and there was one guy that I really wanted to connect with in the event that I was going to leave the pod. And, uh, and I just wanted to just express words of affection for him and that I'm going to be praying for him for whatever reason, the Lord just kind of put him on my heart early on. I was able to develop a a relationship with him. He was one of the guys that was a part of the Bible study and, uh, and just had a heart for him. So, um, so I, I have my bag and he's on my tier and I just run over to his door to basically try and say a last word in the event that I end up leaving while I'm with the chaplain yeah. and, and at that point in time, already the doors are beginning to like bang because they think I'm leaving. Like the, the guys that are seeing me with my bag and, and out of my cell, they're, they're already starting to bang their doors because they think that this is it. Now at that point, 
the guard said, you can put your bag away. You're not going anywhere. So I put my bag away. But that was like a little bit of a, a foretaste of what would happen. So I went down and I'm with the, the chaplain and he and I are talking. And, and, and while we're talking, they're going like, Coates, this is it. You're going. So, so he prays for me. And, and then I run upstairs to grab my bag. And, and then I come down with my bag and I'm, I'm saying goodbye to the guys on my tier who were on exercise at that point. And, and, all, and the doors, they're banging. And so I turn around just at the exit of the pod and I wave and the place just begins to shake. Um, wow. the, just, just begins to, to shake as guys in their cells are banging on their doors. And uh, it was really, it was a moment. I looked over at the guards and, and I could see on their face, they were affected by it. Like they, this was a moment that we were all witnessing. And, um, wow. and so they were impacted by it. Even the chaplain who witnessed it emailed me after the fact and just said that uh, he'll never forget that moment. Um, it was, yeah. it was a moment. And um, yeah. And so that was kind of a sweet moment right before mm -hmm. some really unsweet moments, because from that point on getting out of the pod and exiting the building, uh, it's a pretty dehumanizing experience. Um, it uh, you're, you're treated like property mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I'm, it's hard to go into detail on all of that, but it's just, uh, you know, until you get out, it's, um, it's, it's just an, un, it's an unsavory experience. And I remember that day getting out and, and the moment that my family and I reconnected, that's on video for folks to be able to see and witness. And that was a yeah. real and raw moment. Yeah. And uh, we got in the car and we're driving home and we're getting onto the highway to head home. And I just began to weep. And I couldn't even tell you why I don't to this day. I, I don't know. And it's not joy. It was, it was a grief. Yeah. But I just began to weep over the world that I just witnessed for 35 days and was now. Um, yeah. And even now, I mean, I, I, the effect of being in jail seems to have gone away. Like I, that, it seems like a long time ago. And so life's back to normal. I don't think that being in jail has scarred me or anything like that. Um, but, uh, but you're exposed to a world, a system that is ugly when you are in prison. And uh, it, it's even a bit of a scary system. And, and, because I mean, you're seeing you're seeing the legal system and 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 how it can be corrupt at times, how it can be unjust. Your uh, even just like the way that that um, Alberta Health Services, which is our health service department, administers medication to the inmates on the inside. I mean, that in and of itself is really. So, so guys basically come um, off the street and, and they're, they're in the remand center and, you know, they could be heroin addicts. Um, and, and so what, what HS does is to help these guys to detox, they can sign up for basically what amounts to government regulated heroin. And, uh, and so basically, you know, Throughout the day, multiple times a day, guys are, are called to get their meds and, and they get into a line and they're basically administered um, government regulated heroin. It, it doesn't like, really? it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't make them like high where um, if they use it properly, it doesn't make them high where, you know, they're like on the floor, like you would imagine someone after they've just injected heroin into their body yeah um but uh but it that that opens up a whole side of corruption within the jail that i won't even get into right now as well um so you're just exposed to an ugly system and uh and and so to get to get to get out of that uh there was just there was some grief it was a bit of an adjustment but i i you know i uh i kind of feel like in that sense you know, things have returned to normal internally for me, having gone through that and experienced that. Right, right. 
And James, tell us, um, I have two, th- two things I want to ask you, but um, for those of you, for those watching who don't know, how many children do you have? Tell us a little bit more about your family, your wife, Aaron. And- yeah, I've got two boys. Uh, the oldest is 18. The youngest is 11. Yeah. And, um, you know, they're, they're doing well. I mean, they both responded to me being imprisoned differently. And um, I think, you know, it's hard to remember right now. I think, um, I think my youngest, if I remember correctly, struggled initially, but then, you know, was able to kind of get to a place where he was coping well. And then the oldest was the opposite where I think he was okay initially, but as time went on, it got harder. Mm. It was either that way or the reverse, but, um, yeah, you know, they, they, they've done well. I mean, I think, um, I think from the outside, and this is difficult, like from the outside looking in, like for yourself and for your, your, your audience, as they look in on going through something like this, um, it's, it's, it's hard for me to impart to you all what it, what it's really like. I mean, I can say stuff like, well, it's not glamorous, which nobody would question, but it's, you're, it's just life. Like you're just going through life and, and you're, you're suffering for Christ and, and, um, it's, uh, it's just your lot. And, and so for, for people on the outside looking in, it's, it's this, um, I wouldn't even know how to describe what it's, what it's like, but, but to try and convey to you reality as it is for us, as we're living it, it's just life. We're just, you know, the, the sun rises and sun sets and you're just going day by day through, through this experience. And so, yeah, they've, they've done really well. Um, uh, I think, I think it's, it's, it's been beneficial for both of them spiritually. Um, you know, our oldest is, is walking with the Lord. He's, he's obeyed the, the Lord in baptism and, and he's, he's, he's bearing fruit, which is wonderful. My youngest is, uh, is in a place where like he, he wants to follow Christ. His desire is to follow Christ, but he's, he's, he's just wrestling with the new birth and, and, um, and obviously he can't, he can't bring the new birth about. Right. But he's, he's called to believe on Christ. And so he's, you know, we're not totally sure where he's at, but he's in a, I think a healthy place for an 11 year old who's, who's wrestling with, with what it means to, to, to believe on Christ. And yeah, yeah, so they're, they're doing well. I don't think either of them have been scarred by this at all. Like I don't think either of them are, are, um, experiencing things in their life that are going to have a negative impact on them at all. I think, you know, this season is stressful for all of us. I mean, you know, talking about COVID-19 and government restrictions and all of that, that, that that's talked about a lot. And, yeah. and so that there's a, there's a tension or a stress I'm sure they experience inside because life is just tumultuous right now. But, right. Um, but I think they're both doing well ultimately. Good. Well, as I said, those boys will be able to, you know, as they grow up, they'll, they'll be able to say mom and dad believed what they professed, hmm. lived it out. And um, so what a tremendous blessing that is. Yeah. Um, okay. So an- another thing I wanted to ask you about is, I don't know if it was the Sunday after or maybe two Sundays after your release, but I've seen the video of where y'all were having service this was before they put the fences up and uh, I want to ask you about that too, but um, uh, the police were out there with the health official. I don't remember his exact title and, and they wanted to come into the service. The service was already in progress and your elders prevented them from coming in because of this Canadian, the, a law that Canada has, I don't remember the address of it, but you cannot interrupt a worship service that is in progress. And so um, and Kathy and I were talking about this. <laughs> Kathy and I have talked about y'all so much, but uh, we were both really encouraged by how your elders handled that situation. Um, they were respectful. They did not berate them. And uh, there's another pastor in Canada that has also been 
arrested and I'm not going to even go into, um, but I'll just say this, what a stark contrast between how Grace Life and your elders handled the police and how this other Canadian pastor has handled the police berating them and, and calling them Nazis and all that. Um, I was really impressed with your elders and how they handled that. They were respectful and yet firm. No, this is the law. So tell us a little bit, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? I know you've seen the video. Yeah, no, I think they did a phenomenal job. Now, I should clarify, uh, there were two gentlemen there. One is an elder in training. The other is a deacon. Oh. And, uh, and, but yeah, they did, they did incredibly well. That, that required courage. I mean, you can hear it when the conversation begins. Um, just in the sound of the voice as they assert Section 176 of the Criminal Code yeah. that this is like hard you know, and, and that's what courage is. Like courage is courage in the face of fear. Right. And so there was fear in their hearts, but it was the courage that like plowed over that fear. And yeah. yeah. And yeah, the way that they handled it is consistent with the way that we've handled everything. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, we, that's our, uh, we believe that's, that's Christ likeness on display. And, and so we need to be firm and yet respectful and so, um, yeah, I really appreciate the way that they've handled things and, 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 and think that, that we've, we've done well as a church to handle what we've gone through. I think it's garnered respect from the RCMP and even in some respects from AHS. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, I prefer the way that we've handled things for sure over and against the way uh, Pastor Art has. Um, you know, Pastor Art's coming from a certain um, political context that he's, he's grown up in and that, that, that likely shapes the way he handles things. I don't know pastor art personally and, uh, and appreciate the way that you've um, just been sensitive about, about even uh, just using that as a contrast. Um, I wouldn't do it the way pastor art has. And, uh, but, but I don't want to condemn the way he's done it per se either. Um, I think that that's between him and the Lord at this point, but, um, but it's not the way that we want to do it. And, and we like the way that we've done it. And, and that's the way we, we, we plan to continue to carry things out for sure. Yeah. Yeah. We're to pray for those and, and governing authorities, um, or as governing authorities. And even when we disagree with them, we're to pray for them and, and show them respect. Um, so I, I think y'all, I just want to commend you. I, I think you and the leadership there at Grace Life have, have handled that as well as it could be handled. And I, I think it's just a really good testimony for a watching world. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. In that. So James, where, where do things stand now? Okay. So we've all seen the, they put up the, the fence, I think, was double or triple layered even. Then. But uh, so you're not in your building. Tell us where things stand right now. Yeah, so right, right now um, we're working on an injunction that we plan to file that will endeavor to get our building back. And we think that based on the legal uh, sort of assessment of things that that's that's a a reasonable possibility that that we can win an injunction on this thing um so we don't have access to our building and uh and we're we're continuing to meet and uh we're doing that at at undisclosed locations and uh and you know it's it's going it's going reasonably well um the the possibility of enforcement is 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 still there so the the possibility of me heading back to the remand center is certainly there um you know in the case of pastor art he was released on a condition very similar to the one that i wasn't willing to sign you know in the case of pastor art he was released on a condition very similar to the one that I wasn't willing to sign. And uh, which for me signals that 
So right now, for example, the condition that I got is part of what's being assessed in my own personal trial. I was in court last week for two days. Right. And one of the one of the matters the judge needs to rule on is whether or not my rights to liberty and security were violated through wrongful imprisonment, through a condition that pinned both my religious freedom, which is a charter right, as well as conscience against my liberty, where I was basically having to choose, you know, whether I was going to pick liberty over conscience or vice versa. So there's a possibility that uh, the judge may actually grant a stay to the proceedings uh, on the basis of, of that. And, and then that would really rule out using a condition like that as a bail condition for Mm. a pastor going forward, there'd be precedent against that. So with, Mm. with art receiving the condition that he did, um, it signaled to me, at least at this, at this point that, that there's no hesitation on, on giving a, a condition like the one that I got uh, to me again. And, and so that just kind of elevates all over again. Yeah. The, the possibility of being back in that, at that fork in the road of, of I'm arrested for having a gathering and, and the condition of my release is I've got to abide by the public health orders. And so I'm back at remand. So, um, so that's, that's, the reality of that is, is present even, even today. And, um, and so, you know, it's amazing, right? Because you have a gathering and you get home and you're kind of like, phew, you know, and, and there's like a, a season of time on Sunday where you're, you're, um, you're feeling relief. And then sometime on Monday and certainly by Tuesday, you're now looking at the next Sunday oh. and, and am I going to be able to survive this one? Right. Um, so, so yeah, our building is is locked up. We we don't have access to it. Uh, we're gonna try and get access to it again, and uh, don't know if we'll ever get access to it. Now we're going through all these other issues because our insurance company is gonna drop insurance on our building, and uh, and and then even our lender on our mortgage. They've been supportive of how we've handled things, but um, but without the insurance component being there, they're they're not happy with that arrangement, and so. Uh, we need insurance on our building or it's possible our lender is going to call in the loan on uh, our mortgage. And so there's, there's, there's all that kind of stuff going on. Um, it's kind of a relentless thing. I mean, you know, from, from week to week, there's something new that materializes in all of this and uh, just, you know, puts us in some awkward positions, but you know, all you can do is just uh, swallow the pill and trust the Lord and keep going. And um so, so yeah, we're, we're gathering and, and, and meeting and uh, there's not, I don't know if there's much more to, uh, to report on that. I will say this, that, that we have um, access to, to transcripts from uh, the legislature where, where they've, they've been discussing Grace Life and even what's currently happening with our facility and the fencing and, and the security and everything like that. And they may actually try and bill us for all of that. They, they may attempt to give us a bill for all the fencing and, and the cost of the security, the, all of the costs associated with them taking over our facility, they may give us a bill for that. And, uh, Word. which is amazing, right? Because like they could have just locked our doors. Yeah. They, they didn't need to put up, you know, fencing and all, all the rest of it. And so, yeah, you know, it's subjective. overkill. Yeah, overkill on what, and, and then, and even it would almost seem like it's somewhat symbolic. Like they're, like somehow our government just wants to kind of condition um, our province and country for like a police state. You know what I mean? Like what they've done there, it, it's, yeah. You know, who wrote the playbook on that? Right. And where does that come from? Right. You know, and, and did it come from China? I mean, you know, it's, it's right. really the, the approach they took in securing our building the way they did is unusual. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so, you know, to give us a bill for all of that, when you could have just locked the building is, yeah. is, uh, is 
so we'll see, you know, how that all unfolds. Um, but this is the country we're living in right now. Yeah. I mean, really, I, I would say for Canadians, this is the time to consider leaving Canada. I think, mm. I think we're there and, and I don't know where to go. I mean, there are places in the U S that, that, that would be at least temporarily better than, but yeah. when I look at what's going on there in your country, the, the, the shift is definitely on. Oh yeah. Um, yes. You know, I think your constitution and the way that States function as, as being more independent and autonomous is really helpful. So yeah. there, there are States that, that would seem to provide uh, a healthier place to raise a family and all of that. But, Right. Yeah, I would say it's it, it would the Canadians need to consider whether they want to live in this country at this point in time. And so either Canadians are asleep and don't realize what's going on or or it's time to actually think about leaving. Yeah, now, I, I wouldn't leave, you know, at this point, I, I, I can't leave at this point because I'd be leaving the flock. Right. But yeah. if the if the flock, if we all decided, well, we're going to move to wherever, <laughs> you know. Um, I could see something like that potentially, I do. Um, although I don't envision that happening. Yeah. Yeah. It seems like the United States is, it follows um, socially and culturally, it follows Canada 10, 15 years, you know, we're behind y'all 10, 15 years, but I don't mm-hmm. know. It's, it's happening here at a breathtaking pace. I mean, none of us would have thought two years ago that we would be where we are now. And yeah. so we, I told Kathy the other night, uh, we really no longer live in a free country. We, we used to, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's eroding here as well. Mm-hmm. But, uh, but we're not where Canada is, at least not yet. No. So, so y'all are not out of the woods. I mean, I think a lot, and this is one of the reasons I wanted to do the interview. One of them is I think a lot of people thought, Oh, well he's out now and it's kind of, it's kind of over, but it's, it's not over. You're not out of the woods yet. No. No, I mean, I knew that 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 sunk in that first Sunday that you mentioned, because um, for five weeks while I was in Reman, they didn't try and come in. And and they tried to come in that Sunday. And I was told right before the service began that that the RCMP and AHS won in. And, and so I had a moment by myself in the area that we pray just off the stage in a a little mechanical room where I'm just having to digest everything that I've just experienced. I mean, this is my first Sunday back and, and the fact that they want back in now that I'm out after being on the outside for five weeks, right. You know, I, I, it it was a lot for me to just kind of get my mind right. And I'm, I'm about to speak to my congregation publicly for the first time since my imprisonment. Right. And so there's things that I, I need to say to them. Right. And, right. and so that was, um, that was really unfortunate. And, yeah. and we pressed them actually on a subsequent Sunday on, Hey, why did you guys try and come in after not coming in for five weeks? And, and we pressed this gentleman and he ultimately said, you know, it's my supervisors. So they're just, they're robots. It's, yeah. it's their supervisors who are telling them what to do and when to do it. And, and they're just following orders. And uh, it's, uh, it's just an awful, awful um, government agency. I mean, AHS is horrible. Yeah. Um, it it, it uh, really, it, we need to abolish AHS, you know, uh, to think of the, the language that, you know, that you hear coming from the social justice warriors in, uh, in the U S uh, against agencies that are actually lawful and necessary. Uh, we, we need to abolish AHS. It is just an awful, awful organization and uh, never would have thought that, you know, as things heated up in our country, that it would come through the health service department. Right. I mean, it's genius. But never yeah. saw that coming. Never yeah. saw that coming. And uh, anyway, so, um, so yeah, so I knew we were right back in the midst of it right then. And it was tough, actually. That was a tough week for me because I had to basically get back into the frame of mind that I was in 
prior to my imprisonment. And, and it wasn't just easy. It wasn't just like, okay, well, let's just do this again. I had to kind of start all over again. Yeah. I mean, that was the whole thing about being in prison. It was reprieve. I mean, while I was in prison, I couldn't break the so-called law that I had been breaking this whole public health act thing. Yeah. So by being in prison, I was actually some, in some ways safe. Yeah. Um, so to right. come out and now I'm, I'm, I'm back in the, the driver's seat of this obligation that I have to my Lord and savior to, to, to bring the, the body of Christ together for worship. Well, now I'm back in that, that pressure cooker of, of pressure where, um, you know, I've got the law breathing down my neck, this uh, unjust law. And, and so, yeah, so it was, it, it, it wasn't over and isn't over and there's no end in sight. I mean, there just is no end in sight. I, I don't know. And that's what I've been praying. I've been saying, Lord, like, what's the end point to all of this? I mean, we can't stay in this state of flux forever. We've got to get to the the determined new normal destination at some point. And so where is that? And when will we get there? And, and how long is it going to take to get there before our government feels like it's accomplished what it needed to accomplish uh, in this, in this season. And uh, I mean, I think, I don't know where your eschatology is, but, but, you know, if you, if you see a, a man of lawlessness coming where, an antichrist is going to uh, step onto the scene and, and there's going to be a one world government under that, under that man. I think our country has shown that it's going to roll over. Yeah. I mean, it, it, we, we are conditioned and ready to roll over and submit to whatever is on the horizon, which, you know, is discouraging on one level and somewhat encouraging on another because, you know, I think there's way more resistance in the U.S. You know, the, the conditioning that would have to happen in your country to bring that country to the point where it would be ready to just hand over its civil liberties. I think there's way more conditioning required. In Canada, no way. I mean, we're ready. We're, we're, we're good. So, so in that sense, I figure, well, you know, if, if we're ready, then we don't really need much more of this before you kind of get to a quote-unquote new normal where, you know, we're just living in this more governmentally controlled environment with privileges the government grants to us instead of rights that are God given and, exactly. and where we can kind of get into some semblance of, okay, this is what life's going to look like in this new, but right now it's just a state of flux, you yeah. know, and it's, uh, so you're just kind of wondering when are we going to get to the destination that's intended for this particular crisis that the, the government is capitalizing on. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, yeah, was it Saul Alinsky, I guess it said, uh, never let a crisis go to waste. And, and this has certainly been a great opportunity and, and the Canadian government and the United States government, unfortunately, at least the, the new administration here, the Biden administration is, they're not letting a, a good crisis go to waste. And, and, and you, Kathy and I have talked about this a lot. I mean, you can see how before, before spring of last year, it was a little bit more difficult to imagine how is the whole world going to follow after this antichrist, you know, and it just, it was hard to wrap your mind around that, but now it's not quite as hard because you, you actually see it happening. Not that it, the antichrist capital A antichrist has come on the scene yet. But, but it's a preview. It's, it's a preview of coming attractions. It's, you can see it now. It's like, oh, yeah. wow, people really will just follow after, you know, the powers that be and just roll over. And uh, yep. it's, it's been disheartening to see how many people have rolled over here. Um, yeah. Not, not to the extent that Canada has, but, but nonetheless, uh, uh, yeah, a disturbing a disturbingly high percentage of people here, even in some of our theological circles, sadly, you know, the, the social justice stuff that's, uh, speaking of which, mm. James, Pastor James, um, what would you say, given all that you've been through and are continuing to go through, what would you say to those churches who have 
the attitude, well, yes, we should meet together. Hebrews 10, we're, we're to not forsake the assembling. That's what we need to do. But uh, if your church decides, well, these are unusual times. We have a pandemic. Um, we can forego that until this blows over. And it's just a matter of conscience. You know, if, if, you, if your church wants to meet, that's great. But if your church decides, well, maybe we shouldn't, that's okay too. It's kind of like an adiaphora thing. What, what would your response be to that? Adiaphora meaning uh, is an issue that people say there's no clear instruction from Scripture, so you kind of leave it up to your conscience. It's neither right nor wrong, whatever you want to do. What, what would your so, response be to that? Yeah. Well, I think there's definitely an ecclesiological issue that, that, um, that needs to be addressed more fully that there's a low ecclesiology that, um, that, that exists in our time and, and even just a, a reductionism, like we're reducing the Christian life to the gospel. And so as long as you're not being persecuted for the gospel, you're not really being persecuted, which is a, an unbiblical redefinition of what persecution is. I mean, it's to be persecuted for the sake of righteousness. It's, it's, it's to suffer for the name of Christ, which goes beyond just the gospel. It includes that. So yeah. I think um, there's just a really low ecclesiology and in and, and understanding what has God ordained to be the corporate gathering. And, and when are you now altering what the corporate gathering is to the extent that it no longer is what God ordained it to be? Um, for example, we, we gather on Sunday as the, the corporate body. We have midweek gatherings that are smaller components of the body that are there for edification and the utilization of the, the plurality of giftedness in the body. Yeah. Yeah. But we recognize that those aren't corporate gatherings. It's not the gathering of the church. It's a Bible study. So, so with churches now, basically dividing their body up into as many gatherings as they can to meet the conditions that are in place. It's no longer the corporate gathering. You're, you're, and, and the gathering's not just about the pastor and what he does to the people that the corporate gathering is, is the whole body coming together. The, the, the language of the body being uh, many members. Yeah. And, and, and so you're going to basically cut off portions of the body from other portions of the body as if that doesn't have an impact on the spiritual health and development of the body. Right. You know, when we come together as a, a body of believers and, 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 and do so corporately and we have the structured portion of our service where the, the means of grace are in my estimation, most operative, the ordinary means of grace are most operative in building up the body of Christ. And then you, you shift from the structured part of your, of your gather, your gathering to the unstructured part where now one anothering is happening yeah. where, where the body is present to minister to itself. When you divide your gatherings up into multiple gatherings, you're, you're, you're cutting people off from necessary vital members that are, that are not able to interact with each other for the building up of the body of Christ. And so, not only is it ecclesiological at that point in time, then it becomes a matter of spiritual growth and development. And so what I'm beginning to see as I reflect on this is that not only is there a low ecclesiology, there's a really low view of sanctification. Mm. And, and so pastors are in essence compromising the sanctification of their people in order to uphold their health, their physical health. Right. And, right. and that becomes concerning for me because as a pastor, I need to be certainly concerned with my own personal holiness, but I should be also concerned for the holiness of my people. And, and so if, if this season doesn't trigger concern for the holiness of the people that you shepherd, then it makes me concerned on two fronts. One, that, that, that you ought to be concerned for the holiness of your people and how this season's affecting that. And two, I'm concerned about 
the holiness of the pastors who aren't concerned about the holiness of their people. I mean, if they're not concerned about the holiness of the people, then how concerned are they about their own holiness? That's right. And so, that's right. Um, so I think that the issues that are on the table here, and this is where you realize that all of theology is connected, mm-hmm. that every category of theology is, is connected to the other. You can't, you can't isolate any, portion of theology from the other they they all come together and interconnect and and uh, and so i just think that we're showing how weak our theology is yeah by by handling things the way that we are and and that tells you where the church is at present in terms of its health and development and and uh and so you know you've got this this judgment that's coming upon the household of god first peter four and and it's gonna expose the true from the false and, and it's going to purify the true and make her ready for her bridegroom. And, and that's where we are right now. Yeah. Amen. Well said. Well said. I, I give a hearty amen to everything you just said. And mm. I, I, um, I was really encouraged by your sermon on Romans 13, just before your imprisonment and uh, linked to that. I put it in the uh, video that I interview that I did with Aaron and I would commend that to people as well. So if uh, folks, if you're watching, if you're hearing this for the first time, look down in the, in the description below and you'll see a link to Pastor James uh, exposition of Romans 13, obeying the governing authorities. And uh, James, not, I'm not going to ask you to preach your whole sermon again, but, but give us, what would you say to those uh, kind of cliff note version of those who say, well, the governing authorities are telling us to not meet and we're to obey the governing authorities. You, you talked in your sermon about the government overstepping its bounds and, and getting into an area, specifically the church, that it has no jurisdiction in. Right. So walk us through that, just, just cliff note version, if you would. Yeah, all authority is Christ's. He's, he declares in Matthew 28, all authority has been given unto me. And, and that means that every expression of earthly human authority is delegated. And if it's delegated, it's limited. And so you can see that in the scriptures, you've got um, the church, the family, and the government as spheres of authority that exist. And, and each sphere has authority to govern um, in accord with the limits that God places on those spheres. And, and there's certainly overlap in some respects with respect to uh, the home, the family, and the government. But there are clear lines of distinction where, where jurisdiction over matters of worship exclusively belong to the church and, and where parenting um, belongs to the parents and where governing belongs to the government. And so uh, when people want to say that, that we have to submit ourselves to the government regardless of whether or not the law they've put in place is just or not, or regardless of whether or not it's an overreach on their authority, in effect, uh, they are making the government out to be God, essentially, yeah. where, where, the, where the government can create laws without any accountability, and our responsibility is to abide by those laws. And, and so that's a failure to recognize that there are limits that are placed on the, the authority of government, and it, it fails to recognize that there is... is that which ought to be rendered to Caesar and there is that which ought to be rendered to God. Yep. And, and my concern, both in the unbelieving world, as well as within the context of the professing church, is that, that people are essentially treating government like it's God, that it has authority to essentially declare anything. And, and we have this obligation to, to abide by it. So, it's a, it's, a, it's a poor view of government. I think we've all, in our church anyway, been reading historical works on the doctrine of the lesser magistrate. Mm-hmm. And, and we're, we're, we're seeing our responsibility and even duty to, to oppose unjust laws. And so Christians throughout the centuries past understood this. And, and, and we just so, somehow have not. I mean, we are... Our theology of government is very weak and impotent, and it's lacking a robustness. And, and so I think Christians are just not thinking through this carefully and clearly. 
and and thoroughly and that's why they're they're coming out the way they are yeah absolutely yeah and, and for most of us as christians it's kind of the first time we've actually had to think through these things in a real practical real world rubber meets the road kind of a way and uh and unfortunately i, I think a, a lot of believers or at least professing believers are not seeing this rightly i, I thought your exposition of romans 13 was very well done and very helpful um it's in Acts chapter five, right? We must obey God rather than man. When, yeah. So uh, when man's laws run in contradiction to God's laws, it we have that. That's not a, a difficult choice. We know who we must obey. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, uh, James, have have you? We know that John MacArthur has mentioned you repeatedly from the pulpit and. Uh, it's been very encouraging uh, of you and Grace Life there in Edmonton. Uh, have you spoken with him? Yeah, we've talked oh. a couple of times, and uh, he's been incredibly uh, supportive and encouraging. And um, so I've been uh, I've been blessed by that. I mean, his ministry has impacted my life uh, more than any other. And uh, and then even stock, uh, Dr. Stephen J. Lawson. Um, you know, his influence on my life in recent years as well through the doctor ministry program at the master seminary has been significant and he's been really supportive as well. Uh, the master seminary has been, um, wonderful. I was able to address the graduating class of 2021, uh, on Sunday through a video that I sent. Oh, and, uh, and, and so that was an honor to do that and to charge those men to, be resolved to follow Christ no matter the cost. And uh, yeah, so the support that I've received from John MacArthur and, and um, Stephen J. Lawson and, and even Tom Askell, Jared, um, it's just been great. It's yeah. been, uh, it's been, it's been really, really good. Yeah. Yourself. Yeah. Well, brother, you've been a great encouragement to so many of us, you and your family and your church. And we really do thank you. Thank you for your faithful witness. And um, is there anything, of course, I would encourage all of my viewers here, um, pray for James, pray for his wife, Aaron, their family, pray for Grace Life Church, uh, pray for them. Because as we said a few minutes ago, this is not over. They're not out of the woods yet. So, uh, and James, we're going to continue to lift you up, brother. And uh, is there is there anything in a more tangible way that we can help you? What what would you like to say to to the viewers? What is there anything in addition to prayer that we can do for y'all? You know, I don't I don't know that right now there is, and and prayer is incredibly practical and um, needed. And so uh, that you'd be praying for us would be wonderful. And we're just struggling in some ways to just do the bread and butter of ministry right now. And, and even, even something as practical as me determining what I'm going to preach on Sunday is a challenge. And so even if you're praying that the Lord would uh, providentially provide me with what it is that I'm going to preach on Sunday, I mean, he knows, right, what I'm going to preach. Yeah. And, and right now I don't. And that's uncomfortable. Um, so the sooner I know, uh, the better. And hopefully I can settle that even, even today. I realize your audience may not hear this uh, today. But um, yeah, prayer is, is uh, incredible. If there are other needs that arise along the way, we'll, we'll do our best to make folks aware of that. But right now, prayer is critical. Yeah. And so you, the church continues to meet just in different, you know, undisclosed location. Uh, that's correct continue to meet and uh, so yeah brother we will be praying for you and your flock so, thank you justin i appreciate it thank you thank you jack thank you for hey, talking. you're welcome hello dear ones i mentioned in the video that john macarthur has mentioned james coates a number of times from the pulpit and i wanted to show you an excerpt of this uh, shortly after his release, James wrote a letter to John MacArthur and Grace Community Church just expressing his appreciation to them for their support. And so, watch this. A 
As we begin our worship today, I, I have a great privilege and honor before we have a word of prayer and sing a hymn to read a letter to you uh, this morning. Grace Life Church up in Alberta, Canada uh, is meeting somewhere. Uh, we don't know where. Uh, James Coates said at this point it's uh, not for the public to know. Amazing to have an underground church in Canada. Um, this uh, because the government of Alberta uh, triple fenced the church in and locked it so people couldn't go there. I think uh, the latest statistics I've seen are that um, 2,000 people have died through the months of COVID. 80% of them uh, in senior homes. Uh, the, the remaining ones had some kind of comorbidity out of the millions of people who live in Alberta. So there's no legitimate reason to do what they did to this church, especially at this point in the COVID life. But they did. And um, this is a first for the Western world to have the government lock out believers from a church, and that after imprisoning James Coates, who's a graduate of the Master's Seminary, uh, in maximum security prison, they led him away in chains, and he was there for about 35 days. Many of you have been praying for Grace Life Church, and the, uh, the scene is changing. There is a massive outcry against the government for doing this, and um, it, I'm praying along with you that uh, this will draw attention to that church, to him, and to the gospel. And it's already beginning to do that. But he, he sent a letter that he wanted me to read to all of you. Uh, as This is his heart um, of gratitude to Grace Church, so I'm just going to read it the way he sent it yesterday. To Grace Community Church, which is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace in him. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has superabundantly glorified himself through you. For decades, you have been a strong and steadfast pillar and support of the truth. So much so, the Lord has established many other beacons of truth throughout this world as a direct result of your ministry. You have exemplified a profound love for the brethren, warm service and hospitality, and an undeniable love for God and His Word. In fact, His Word has sounded forth from you with such power and precision that the fruit of your ministry is absolutely immeasurable this side of heaven. Pastor John's 52 years of faithful ministry is as much a testimony to you as it is to him. May God richly reward you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the way you cared for me, my family, and congregation during my imprisonment. Your love and prayerful support were vital to our steadfastness in the face of suffering. The letter from the elders was an immense encouragement. The support from Dr. Nathan Busenitz and the Master's Seminary was both humbling and strengthening. And the pastoral care provided by Pastor John was incredibly comforting. It was also a rich blessing to receive letters from a number of you while imprisoned. Those letters provided necessary fuel for my resolve. My wife, Erin, also sends her greetings and thankfulness. She was and continues to be greatly strengthened by your letters. You poured into her early in her spiritual development, and you are pouring into her now as well. You have suffered well for the gospel. It is an indescribable blessing to join you in that suffering. Our congregations have been counted worthy for this purpose. May we rejoice in this, as did the apostles in their sufferings. Jesus Christ is the sovereign Lord over all creation and the supreme head of the church. We will bow to him and him alone. Only he is worthy. And now may he continually strengthen you unto all faithfulness and may he constantly radiate his honor and glory through you. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. James Coates. A wonderful letter, isn't it?
and here we are meeting and they're not. And uh, it's not because we're worthy of such kindness from the Lord, it's grace, isn't it? Grace has always been full of grace. And we're seeing it at the hand of the Lord. They keep postponing our court day. Um, this is, I think, the fifth or sixth time they've postponed it. Now till, I guess, June 23rd. And the state is supposed to open June 15th. So it looks like the judge just punted. <laughs> it was fourth and 98. Let's pray. Father, we pray for our dear friend James Coates and Aaron and their family and others who stand with him for Grace Life Church up in Alberta, that the word will continue to sound forth from them. We thank you for his godliness, his manliness, his courage, his conviction, his strength, his resolve. Thank you for the work you've done in his heart so that he would be strong and courageous and put himself in a position of obedience, no matter what the cost, so that you could be honored. Even as he concluded his letter, his words are our prayer. May you, O oh Lord, constantly radiate your honor and glory through us, through Grace Church and through Grace Life Church. To you be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, dear ones, I trust that you were as encouraged and edified by that as I was. It was a beautiful letter and uh, just a special time there for John MacArthur to read that to his congregation on that Sunday morning. As I mentioned earlier in the video, uh, James Coates was really maligned by a lot of professing Christians that were in or are in the social justice movement and saying things like, he brought this on himself, he's a tension seeker and uh, you know, a, a martyr and just making himself out to be a martyr and, and just some horrible things that social justice warriors were saying about him and that um, was not at all surprising. What was surprising was uh, some people in our theological camp, at least theoretically, uh, people who are very much opposed to the social, social justice movement and what it teaches. Um, for example, someone sent me this. Uh, this is uh, from Tim Hurd. He posted that video that I just showed you. He, he posted it on his YouTube channel. And by the way, Tim Hurd posted this very much in support of James Coates and uh, John MacArthur reading the letter. And uh, then this gentleman, as you can see, who is against social justice and uh, at least theoretically in our theological camp, he said, three things. John Mack reading the letter by Coates was entirely self-serving. Let me, that is, um, I just, I don't understand that mindset. John MacArthur was sharing um, a letter from a pastor who has been through just um, an unimaginable trial. Uh, he was sharing it for the encouragement and edification of the saints, which it did that. It encouraged and edified me, and I'm sure it did you too. If, uh, so it, that is, um, I just don't understand that kind of mindset to, to disparage John MacArthur's motives in such a way. And then he says, some members of Grace Life Church helping the police put back up fencing is not testimony, but supporting unjust and unlawful actions. So this gentleman understands that putting um, the fence around the church was unjust and unlawful. It was. But he says members of Grace Life Church helped the police do that. Well, I happen to, happen to know that that's factually not true. There were some uh, protesters, uh, many of whom professed to be believers, and they did, um, well, initially the fence was taken down, and then some of those uh, protesters, professing believers, helped the police put the fence back up. But they were not, none of them were members of Grace Life Church. Grace Life Church was meeting in a secret, undisclosed location. 
So whoever these people were that helped the police put the fence back up, they were not members of Grace Life Church. And I have that um, directly from James Coates himself in an email that uh, he and I exchanged just yesterday. And then he says, Grace Life Church meeting in, a, in secret is an act of cowardice. I, you heard James Coates. You watched the interview. You saw the man. You saw his heart. You saw what he's been through. I guess I'll leave it up to you if you think that he is a coward. I just, I don't understand that. I don't get it. But, uh, whatever. I, for one, um, and I know many, many others, are very appreciative of James Coates and uh, the stand that they have taken. And and let me kind of land this plane this way. Uh, dear ones, the Bible says, 2 Timothy chapter 3, all those who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. There are no exception clauses to that unless you live in the United States of America or unless you live in Canada, unless you live in the Western world. You know, we think of persecution as something that happens to believers in Iran, in Syria, and North Korea, and certainly they do experience horrific persecution. Persecution on a scale that none of us have seen uh, living in the in the Western world. Now, I know I have people all over the world watching this, and I praise the Lord for that. But, uh, you know, in a, in a, in a democracy, we, we haven't seen that. Uh, not yet. But, but if you have never experienced at least some soft persecution somewhere in your life, then you're not living godly in Christ Jesus. If we live godly in Christ Jesus, there will be persecution. Maybe not imprisonment like what James Coates has already experienced. Maybe not like uh, what goes on in North Korea and Iran, but uh, there should be some soft persecution everywhere. Uh, if you're if you're truly living in Christ Jesus for everyone, I should say. So ready yourself now. Um, make up your mind now, just like Daniel and his friends Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Daniel chapter one. They made up their minds that they would not defile themselves with the king's choice food or or the wine which he drank. Make up your mind now, uh, because persecution is coming. It's going to come. It is. It will be increasing should already have some soft persecution, but the hard stuff um, will come if the Lord tarries. And so I want to close by showing you an excerpt from uh, another sermon preached by Mike Riccardi. Uh, Mike Riccardi is one of the elders there at Grace Community Church. He's a friend of mine, wonderful, wonderful guy, and just an outstanding preacher. But uh, I'll close with this. Watch this excerpt, and I'll put a, a link to the full sermon down below. But uh, watch this brief excerpt from Mike Riccardi's sermon that he preached on April the 18th, uh, 2021. You never see somebody trying to build a storm shelter in the middle of a Category 5 hurricane or when an F5 tornado enters their neighborhood. Nobody with any sense waits for a house fire to start before they begin building a fire escape. Why? Because in the moment that tragedy strikes, you don't have time to think clearly, to evaluate your options, to construct systems of defense. The craziness of the moment simply won't allow it. You need to be so prepared for disaster that the moment you detect it, second nature kicks in and you follow the plan. You've got a fire escape route. You've got the storm shelter well stocked, whatever it is. The same thing is true, friends of Christian suffering. I don't believe it's possible to overstate how important it is to have a rock-solid theology of suffering before you enter into it. Because in the midst of some exceedingly painful trial, the craziness of the, the moment hardly ever allows for cool contemplation and sound reflective reasoning. The storm shelter of biblical truth that keeps you grounded in the midst of the hurricane of suffering can't be constructed in the middle of the storm. It needs to be set firmly in place ahead of time so that it can serve as a sure and steadfast anchor in the midst of whatever turmoil we might experience. We need to be equipped to suffer well before that suffering comes upon us. And without being a doomsayer, 
I want to suggest to you, brothers and sisters, that the hurricane is coming. It shouldn't take us by surprise because the Lord Jesus warned us that the world that hated him would hate his followers. John 15, 20, if they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, 12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. But the time is coming for us, for followers of Jesus in North America, to experience a level of opposition to the gospel that we have not before. I wonder if any of you could have imagined that you'd live to see the government sue churches because they're gathering together on the Lord's day in obedience to Christ's command. Could you have ever imagined you'd see, as is done to our brothers and sisters up in Canada, a church building fenced off and padlocked by the government and guarded by 200 police officers preventing worshipers from entering? Could you have ever imagined that the governing authorities would put a pastor in jail for assembling with his congregation for Sunday worship? I'm convinced that the most serious calling and stewardship that pastors have today is to prepare their congregations to endure persecution in a way that honors Christ. Because if you think that craziness is staying up in Canada, you're wrong. May not be here tomorrow, it may not be here next year, but unless the Lord disposes otherwise by his providence, friends, it is coming. In my lifetime, and I watch a brother that I went to seminary with spend days, month, a month in jail apart from his family, and I ask myself, are you ready to be locked out of church? Are you ready to face crippling fines that could result in the seizure of your property? Are you ready to go to jail and be separated from your family? Are you ready to lose your job for refusing to bow to the cultural totalitarianism that demands that you call Richard Rachel? That demands that you live by the lies of the new paganism? We need to be equipped to suffer well. We need to be equipped to stand firm in the face of persecution, to remain faithful in the midst of trials because those trials are coming. And that's because this world is not our home. In the opening verse of 1 Peter, Peter calls the believers he's writing to those who reside as aliens. The term speaks of a, a temporary resident in a foreign place. Those who don't have the rights of citizenship, but are temporary foreign residents of that area. Peter will say in chapter 2, verse 11, that we are aliens and strangers in the world. Hebrews eleven thirteen says that believers in the promises of God confess that they are strangers and exiles on the earth. Philippians 3, 20 says our citizenship is in heaven. And in 1 Peter 1.17, the beginning of our text this evening, Peter speaks of the believer's present life as the time of your stay on earth. Do you hear how temporary that sounds? Where do you hear about your stay? When you're in a hotel, I hope you enjoyed your stay, sir. You're not living in that hotel. You're not setting up business in that hotel. You're passing through. You're a sojourner. You're a pilgrim. You're a stranger journeying through the foreign land that is planet Earth to your country of citizenship. And so you should only expect suffering. It only makes sense that the world would hate those who are not its own. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples in John 15, 19. He said, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, because of this, the world hates you. You're a pilgrim. You are not of this world. You speak differently. You behave differently. You enjoy different things. You are unimpressed with the worldly lusts that so captivate the hearts of the people in this country. And they hate you. 
because of it. What does Peter say in chapter 4, verse 4? He says, they are surprised that you do not run with them into the same excesses of dissipation, and they malign you. A life lived according to the customs of the country of your citizenship indicts the sinful lifestyle of those who live according to their own lusts and pleasures, and it provokes them to hate you. And then, besides a holy life, the world hates those who, like their Lord, testify of it that its deeds are evil, John 7, 7. The world cannot abide those who will stand up and testify that Richard is not Rachel, that marriage is not up for redefinition, that the child in the womb is not a clump of cells until the mother decides he's a person, but he's an image bearer of Almighty God who alone determines personhood, who will hear that Christ is God, that he has lived and died and risen again, and that there is no name given among men under heaven by which anyone must be saved, that he is the way, the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by him. You testify of those things, and trouble is coming. That hurricane, that tornado, that earthquake is coming, and we need to be prepared ahead of time to weather that storm to endure faithfully, to suffer well, as the title of our series explains, to stand firm. Stand firm, dear ones. The storm is coming. Stand firm. And do pray for James and Aaron and their family and Grace Life Church up in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. They're not out of the woods yet, but God is in control. Thank you very much for watching, dear ones. Until our next time together, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with you all.